Uh, Valerie, let me turn to you. You are a storyteller and a very wise one, given your age. Um, how does your generation see the male-female thing? Is it a given that you have essentially equality? I think that my generation has, has arguably grown up as the most diverse generation in the history of the world, the most multiracial, multicultural, multireligious, in a way that makes talk of diversity not something novel, but something that's a, a reality, just, just as Sharon had mentioned. And I think that's what, what's different about our generation. This is why I call us the shadow generation, is that we have come of age in the shadow of September 11th, where we have been growing up inside a narrative of power that asks us to divide the world into us and them, into black and white, into saved and not saved, and into man and woman. And that these experiences growing up uh, fundamentally press up against this narrative that we are asked to now enter and take as, as our own. And what's, what I think is really promising with the election of Barack Obama now, you know, almost uh, 10 years after 9-11, is that, is that we are emerging out of the shadows that we are finding within ourselves uh, the strength and the courage to actually enter these institutions of power and exercise our voices, tell our stories in a way that transforms these institutions mm -hmm. of power. Um, so that we don't think of man and woman as, as binary, but perhaps gender as plural, that there are multiple ways to exercise, mm -hmm. to perform gender, to perform race, to perform religion. And that there are, in fact, you know, they intersect in very dynamic ways that makes the world far more full of possibility than we've ever imagined before. And so I look at the women around me, especially I'm at Yale Law School now, and you know, it, it wasn't that long ago when <laughs> Yale uh, didn't allow women to even enter the classroom. And I think the previous generation uh, of women saw themselves inside of these institutions of power, whether it was law school or a corporate boardroom or the Congress or a, a church as guests, because they were treated as guests. We were lucky that we were even there. And women now are beginning to realize that the language of power is not so rigid that it cannot be changed by our voices, by our stories, that we can transform these institutions in ways that um, can, can, can in fact transform the world. Is there, um, I, I don't mean for you to speak to be the voice of your entire generation, <laughs> but my way is And you'll be playing that role here. Yes, so we're we're great job. Job. <laughs> and a great one, yes. Um, is there, are there any limits as far as, as young women are concerned, or is it seen as a totally level playing field now? Oh, no. <laughs> <I'm sorry>. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, not, not at all. When I think about the next era of women leadership, I think of it as an era of fierce and bold and dangerous storytelling, where narratives of the state are often instruments of violence. But we ourselves can offer our own stories to challenge that instrument of violence so that we can look at mass incarceration of blacks, for example, and think of not only the racial dynamics, but the economic and the gender and the religious and the ethical. We can think of the war on terror, not just as something that uh, is about national security, but about how hate crimes after 9-11 inevitably led to increases of domestic violence inside right. Muslim and Sikh communities. Right. In other words, I, I think about our generation as a generation with a thousand eyes, like a girl with a thousand eyes, that we're able to look at uh, really complex situations through these multiple lenses given our diverse experiences and tell stories that are actually able to have real life power in, um, in, re in responding to these problems. Very exciting, I must say. <laughs> Terribly <laughs> exciting. So strongly because clearly you're part of the shadow generation as well. Uh, it, it, it's such an interesting concept. Valerie, um, how do you take your faith and think about what you're doing out in the world now? Oh, they're inseparable for me as well. Um, uh, and this, the Sikh tradition is a, is a, is a, is started as a bhakti the devotional movement. Um, and the worship, the prayer um, ritual in the Sikh tradition uh, revolves around uh, music, poetry, um, sometimes dance, this, uh, this experience that transports you up into the divine so that the ego dissolves and you become one, and then returns you on the palm of the divine back onto the earth where you're walking now and you're able to recognize a sort of radical interconnectedness between yourself and, and all beings, that an unending flow of compassion is supposed to come from that. 
Um, of course, that's not exactly what people know <laughs> about the Sikh tradition. Uh, people see most, if you see any man with a turban in the United States, um, the, the chances are that he is Sikh. Um, and so, of course, he, Sikhs were on the forefront of all the violence that came after 9-11. So it's ironic that this turban that Sikhs, some uh, women also wear, that is meant to represent this sort of divine connection and this kind of idea of a saint soldier, that you're saintly but you're soldiering on in the world, is now taken as a mark of a sign of a terrorist. Um, so for me, when I, when I think about my journey after 9-11, um, it was the call to action in the Sikh tradition, this notion of seva, this social justice, that, um, that your connection with the divine is not complete just in prayer, but it's complete in loving and serving the people around you. Uh, it is that notion that came to me when I was hiding in my bedroom after Balbir Singh Sodhi was killed. He was the first man killed in hate crimes after 9-11, the first of 22 people killed in hate crimes uh, after those attacks. And of course, his story wasn't on the evening news. My family knew him, so it was deep in grief, and I didn't want to leave my bedroom, my childhood bedroom, when the words of my grandfather came back to me. Nam da nishnan, he had said. Uh, in order to realize yourself, in order to realize God, you must act here and now without fear. And so it was with those words that I sort of turned to the gray whirlwind that had been spinning outside my bedroom window um, and leapt into it. <laughs> and I think, I think about my bedroom now as sort of that narrative of power, you know, that it's, it's almost safer to stay buried in that narrative, to allow it to provide you with whatever order or shelter that it provides, then feel the stirring of fear in your heart. And the fear points in a direction, and in the direction it points, the whirlwind appears, and it takes some extra faith to have the courage to leap inside and trust that, um, that inside that whirlwind, that you'll be transported up, transported out, and able to find within yourself this call to social justice to do and say the things that you are called to do. And, so when I think about the last, you know, 10 years for me, it's been this huge whirlwind. Um, and I think, I think now... You're making me cry. <laughs> well, this is, this is, well, let me tell you what I've learned about the whirlwind then. I'm like in then. the presence of the next president of the United States. <laughs> president of the United States. <laughs> when you jump into the whirlwind, you fall. <laughs> You fall, and you fall hard, and you're broken and bleeding, and down in that dark hole, uh, you wonder whether it was worth it. You know, I could feel the cost of drawing close to violence, and the cost of speaking out against violence. Um, but I think, <laughs> down in that hole, that you find some kind of freedom that makes it all worthwhile. Mm -hmm. I want to connect something that Bishop Chandra said or something Valerie said. I'm really curious, you're in the belly of a certain kind of beast. Yes. <laughs> yes. And so I'm wondering how the shadow generation really, nuts and bolts, is going to start to antagonize our current understanding of success. OK, and Valerie, you get to do that in 30 seconds. <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> Law school is the belly of a beast for me, and then last summer I spent in the Senate, which was the belly of a much bigger beast. <laughs> and what I discovered about the language of power is that the law especially tries to colonize other ways of knowing and speaking and reasoning. And I, what I try to do, we have a women of color collective at the law school where we're trying to keep alive the other parts of our imagination so that we can develop a way to look at things through multiple lenses. Um, so that we can, I think the call to be a more progressive activist, prog progressive lawyer, progressive thinker is a call to be a more holistic thinker, yes. which I think women are especially poised to do because of this experience of vulnerability and strength in the world. And so I see classmates around me um, not just getting the law degree, but getting a JD with an MD, with a business degree, with this, with that, and, and actually thinking of these degrees as armor, as sword and shield to go out and fight the good fight to enter those institutions from the inside and not just be marching the streets anymore, though that's important, but actually enter it from the inside and stay as the lover stays to transform with love, do law in a loving way, fight in a loving way, be the saint soldier in the most compassionate, loving way possible. And it's hard, it's difficult, but with a sense of community that I think our generation is getting better and better at, um, I think we're in it for the long haul. Mm -hmm. <laughs>